Seeing no further introductions, it is It is now time for question period. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and good morning. Uh, my question this morning is for the ministry, uh, Minister of Energy. Uh, there were a number of uh, contradictory statements made yesterday uh, in the House. The minister said, quote, the IESO has assured my ministry that they have made every effort to be forthright and fully responsive to the Auditor General's request for information. But the Auditor General said, quote, they continually say they're cooperating, but they stalled on giving us information. They wouldn't sign the management representation confirming that they gave us all the information." End quote. So someone here, Mr. Speaker, isn't telling the truth. Mr. Speaker, is the Minister of Energy calling the Auditor General a liar? Very good tightrope walk, but be very cautious, please. And you know what I'm talking about. Minister of Energy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Once again, um, we work with the Auditor General on many instances. We work with our system operator, Mr. Speaker, on a daily basis. And of course, when this came to light, we spoke with the independent electricity system operator, our system operator for the province, and they have assured. Uh, my ministry, Mr. Speaker, that they have made every effort to be forthright and to be fully responsive to the Auditor General's request for information. And they have told me time and time again that they have provided over 200 um, responses and, and received those responses and have provided those uh, information requests. They made staff, they made specific workspaces for the Auditor General staff to be in the uh, system operator's headquarters, and they even adapted from two weeks to seven weeks. So, from the system operator's point of view, Mr. Speaking, they are meeting all of the requirements. Speaker, somebody's not telling the truth here, and somebody's trying to hide something. The, the Auditor General said she was blocked from meetings. You know, they can set up all the workspaces they want, but if the AG isn't getting what she's asking for and what the officers are asking for, and these are independent, non-partisan officers of the legislature, you know, the Auditor General said she was blocked from meetings. The AG asked the ISO, when is the board meeting? We'd like to come. They did it without telling us. But yesterday, the Minister of Energy said when it comes to the board meetings and when it comes to the audit committee, the IESO accommodated every AG request on this. So, Mr. Speaker, why is the Minister of Energy attacking the credibility of an independent officer of the legislature, the Auditor General? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We also have an independent arm's length body in our system operator, Mr. Speaker, and they have informed the ministry that they have done everything they can, Mr. Speaker, to accommodate the AG's requests. The AG has met with the board, Mr. Speaker. The AG has met with the audit committee, and through their audit, the Auditor General staff had direct access to the ISO, ISO staff to ask questions. As I was saying, Mr. Speaker, they are making accommodations to ensure that they can answer every question and be as accommodating as possible through this entire process. The Auditor General has asked for over 40 meetings, Mr. Speaker. Those 40 meetings took place between the AG staff and the uh, uh, independent electricity system operator, Mr. Answer. Speaker. They're going to continue to cooperate with the Auditor General just like our ministry does, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Well, I'm sure the Auditor General is really looking forward to that type of cooperation continuing when she's getting stonewalled at uh, every request. Exactly. All you have to do is read the transcript and then listen to the minister's remarks. He, he was on quite a roll yesterday, Mr. Speaker. Again yesterday, the Minister of Energy said, Ontario families and small businesses are now paying less by average on their bills than any jurisdiction. He said that yesterday, Mr. Speaker. I tell you, that would be news to the folks struggling with hydro bills all across this province when you figure in the massive all-in cost of electricity in Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to know this question from the Minister of Energy. What fantasy world is he living in? Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're living in a world where we're actually making it better for all Ontario families. 
We're living in a world where we reduce bills by 25 percent, but the opposition votes against it. We're living in a world where climate change is real, where the opposition deny it, Mr. Speaker. We're living in a world where we've shut down coal, where this party wants to bring it back, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to live in a world, Mr. Speaker, where we bring forward caring programs for the people of this province, unlike that side that wants to cut, 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 Mr. Speaker. We will make sure that we look after everyone in this province while they just shake their fist and make things up, Mr. Speaker. You seated, please. The, the member from Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation will withdraw. Ron Neanderthal. <laughs> Mr. Look, is looking to be warned if he does not withdraw properly. Withdraw. Hey, withdraw. New question. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Uh, thanks, thanks, Speaker. My question uh, is for the Premier. I love game shows. We're going to have our own little game show here this morning. Uh, she likes playing with the numbers. I know that. So uh, this question. This question is a multiple choice question. Stop the clock. The very beginning was fine, and now we've moved ourselves into a position where I'm going to go for warnings. We're now in warnings. Finish your question, please. Thanks, Speaker. It's a, it's a question for the Premier. and uh, My question is, which scandal is the Premier most proud of? Is it A, the $8 billion scandal on e-health, B, the $2 billion on smart meters, C, the $1.1 billion cancelling gas plants, or D, the $4.5 million salary that she handed to the CEO at Hydro One? Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't see my job as a game. I don't see the job of anyone in this House as a game. Children a great start in education, Mr. Speaker. So what am I most proud of? I'm most proud, Mr. Speaker, that in this province, a child can start school at the age of sometimes three, because they are going to turn four before January 1st. They start at the age of three. They can have full day kindergarten, Mr. Speaker. And then that child now can get free prescription medication if he or she needs it, Mr. Speaker. And then that child, when he's 18 or 17 or 18 and graduates from high school, can get free tuition, Mr. Speaker, to go to college or university, and then that child, Mr. Speaker, can find a job in this province because we are bringing jobs, we are bringing business to this province, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. Uh, we are in warnings. Supplementary. Well, speaker, I'm disappointed I didn't get an answer to my question. I guess uh, maybe maybe the speaker went with uh, E. All of the above uh, was was her response. Another multiple choice question from the premier this morning. Which which, uh, which mismanagement does the premier consider to be the biggest waste? A. The four hundred dollar uh, four hundred million dollars on uh, Presto card cost. Well, yes, the member is warned. Carry on. In case you didn't hear, A, it was $400 million on Presto cards, uh, $304 million over budget on the Pan Am Games, C, the $6.5 million paycheck to consultants over the sale of Ontera, which was only sold for $6 million at a loss of $61 million, D, $36 million on bureaucracy at the local health integration networks, or E, all of the above. Question. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, again, I, I don't see our jobs here as games, Mr. Speaker. And so, uh, what am I most proud of? I'm very proud of that child who has uh, graduated from college or university, has now got a job, was able to attend the Pan Para Pan Games, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, which were a huge success. And came in on budget, Mr. Speaker. On I'm budget. most proud, Mr. Speaker, that as that young person ages, if he or she the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. 
finish, please? If he or she needs care for his uh, parents or grandparents, Mr. Speaker, there's home care available to that family, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. There are personal support workers who are being paid more in this province and are being respected, Mr. Speaker, because we have increased their salaries and we've increased the minimum wage for people across the province. I'm very proud of that, Mr. Speaker. And I'm very proud, very proud that that young person, when he or she retires, is going to have an enhanced retirement security because. Thank you. Senator, please. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the Premier is not doing very well on this test today, but they've lowered the standards. They've lowered the standards so low she might still pass. Speaker, back to the Premier. We know the government is about to plunge us into a pile of red ink this afternoon with Budget 2018. But just how much will the deficit be today? She said it's modest. So this really shouldn't take too long, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier stop me when I get to the right number? How many billions in the deficit? Is it one billion, two billion, three billion, four billion, five, six, seven, eight? Just how high? Just how high is this deficit going to be? I can't count forever, Mr. Speaker. How high is the deficit going to be? Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, um, you know the, the Oh, I think he knows. <coughs> Premier. Mr. Speaker, um, the the contrast between the position of the opposition and uh, and our government and our party is uh, it's it's actually becoming clearer mr yeah. speaker as they talk about the cuts and the social deficits and the damage that they think should be done in this province, Mr. Speaker. And on this side of the House, we're talking about 100,000 childcare spaces, yep. Mr. Speaker, free, t free tuition, Mr. Speaker, for young people. The fact that uh, millions of children will have free, uh, free medication. I've already had free medication, free prescription medication. I think three million Answer. prescriptions, Mr. Speaker. Those are those are the investments that we're making because we believe, Mr. Speaker, that a deficit in care is actually my Thank you. New question. The, the member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier. The question is quite simple. Does the Liberal government believe in universal access? Does the Liberal government believe in universal programs? Mr. Speaker, I think if the member opposite looks at the way we have introduced OHIP Plus, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, it is universal for all of those young people, Mr. Speaker, yep. access to 4,400 medications on the formulary, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if the member opposite looks at the seniors' uh, plan, Mr. Speaker, that we will introduce today to uh, make sure that seniors' prescription medication are completely free, universally free, all 4,400 prescription medications on the formula, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we believe in universality. Look at our preschool child care plan, yes. Mr. Speaker. Yes, we believe in universality. Yes. Supplementary. Yesterday, the Liberal government voted to support the NDP plan to ensure that every Ontarian, no matter their age, can get a prescription, and every Ontarian, no matter who they are, can see a dentist. Will that be in the budget today? Oh. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the budget will be read this afternoon, and I trust that the third party will see that it is a progressive budget that supports care in this province and that they will stand up and vote Would for you it. You say it, please. You say it, please. <clears throat> Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Everyone should be able to fill a prescription, and everyone should be able to see a dentist. Does the Premier believe in that? Mr. Speaker, Premier. yes, I do, but I do not believe that 110 drugs, when there are 4,400 on the formula, 
vocabulary is universality, Mr. Speaker. It doesn't work. Yes, I believe in universal pharmacare. We've taken major steps towards that, and we know there's more to be done, Mr. Speaker. But 110 medications is not is not pharmacare, Mr. No. Speaker, and it's not universality. You see it, please. You see it, please. Nope. Start the clock. New question. The member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. The government has had 15 years to create universal pharmacare. They've had 15 years to create dental care for everyone. Can the Premier explain why her government has ignored these issues for a decade and a half? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We have been working on expanding the Healthy Smiles program, Mr. Yes. Speaker. We have been working on uh, and creating access to dental care. We understand that it's a gap, Mr. Speaker. I would ask the member opposite why it's taken until this week for them to even raise the issue in this legislature. The member from Hamilton, East Stony Creek, is warned. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The Premier says she believes in making sure that Ontarians have dental care, but in 2014 she tried to make it harder to access the Healthy Smiles program for low-income kids. She says seniors should have easier access to their medications, but she tried to raise fees for seniors who need prescription medications just two years ago. Her newfound interest in these issues is just another cynical election ploy, and Ontario families know that. Why does it take an, why does it take an election? and your government's impending end to finally notice people's needs. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows full well that we have been working on expanding access to dental care. The Healthy Smiles program has been expanded across the province, Mr. Speaker. We know that there's more to be done, and I ask that the uh, member opposite pay close attention to the budget this afternoon and then stand up and vote for a progressive budget in this legislature. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. And everyone in this room pays pretty close attention. And if a government believes in investing, it invests. If a government believes in cutting, it cuts. And, Speaker, the best predictor of future behaviour is past behaviour. And I'd like to remind us of what this government has done. This government let child care fees become the highest in the country. They've ignored dental care for a decade and a half. They've ignored universal pharmacare. They've cut health care. They've cut education. They've privatized hydro. Premier, your legacy is 15 years of cuts purposeful neglect and privatization, and we won't let you do more damage. Premier, Ontario is worse off because of your government. How can you possibly be good with that? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Premier. You know, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> I'm very proud that uh, I'm part of a, a party that has always had education in their platform, right. uh, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the last platform, I don't remember one word about education, Mr. Speaker. Um, and if, if present action or future action can be predicted by past action, Mr. Speaker, $600 million was going to come out of health and uh, education, according to, uh, oh, to that right. party. Mr. Yeah, Speaker, we have consistently that. in invested in health care and education, Mr. Speaker. The kids in this province are getting an education that is second to none in the world, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. People come from all over the world to see how we run our, our education system. When we came into office under the previous Premier, the graduation rate in this province was 68 per cent, Mr. Speaker. It is now 86.5 per cent. Kids are graduating and they are going on. Secondary, Mr. Speaker, and they're accessing free tuition because of the actions that this government has taken. You see it, please. You see it, please. New question. The member from First Gray and South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Your pre-election throne speech included big promises to voters, but shamefully none for the accessibility community. In fact, the words disability and accessibility were mentioned zero times in the throne speech. Premier, is accessibility for 1.9 million Ontarians with disabilities that far off your radar, or did you just forget to include them in your vote-buying scheme? 
Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that the minister will want to uh, comment mm -hmm. in the supplementary, but I would ask the member opposite again to be in the House and pay close attention to the budget this afternoon yeah. and, then, yeah. uh, and then vote for the supports that uh, we are putting Looking in place to, to help people care for themselves and the people that they love. Yeah. Thank you. Back to the Premier, Mr. Speaker. The Liberal government will say anything and promise anything to stay in power. You talk a lot about care. For 15 years, you've talked about care, but you have not delivered. It is clear the only thing you actually care about is clinging to power. So, considering the 3,300 word long throne speech wasn't long enough to include in terms of disabilities, I asked the Premier, how can the accessibility community possibly trust you after you continue to leave them behind? Is it just another election ploy? Thank you. Mr. Responsible for Accessibility. Thank you. And, you know, speaker, I know the member said opposite has been very distracted with the PC leadership race and all that's entailed and trying to figure out where those cuts are com coming from. But if he paid attention, Speaker, he would know we've been very active on this file. He would know we introduced an employment strategy for persons with disabilities. He would know we established two new education standards committees under the accessibility legislation education for uh, K-12 and post-secondary. He would know we had a forum last week on the built environment and public uh, spaces. He would know that stakeholders are heavily engaged, Speaker. He would know we're moving the yardsticks on accessibility to make Ontario an accessible province by 2025. And I haven't heard from him, Speaker. I'd love to talk to him about Answer. all these things I just mentioned and more that we're doing to promote accessibility, inclusion, and helping everyone Thank reach their full potential. In this Thank Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier announced another part of her last-ditch attempt to hold on to power. Her child care plan leaves out thousands of Ontario families with kids under the age of two and a half. For years, the Premier and her Liberal government let the price of child care rise in Ontario until it was the most expensive in the nation. If the Premier wanted to make child care more affordable in Ontario, why didn't she do it already? Thank you. Acting Premier. Speaker, Minister of Education, the Minister responsible for early childhood and early years. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I am very pleased to answer this question, Mr. Speaker, because I want to point out that I am the first minister who was appointed minister responsible for early years and child care. And so more than a year ago, I was asked to take a close look at this file and transform the way we deliver child care in this province. The first ask was to deliver close to 100,000 spaces in five years. We're actually ahead of the, the number that we were creating, and we are now moving on to another commitment, which was to transform the way we deliver childcare. Dr. Cleveland's report actually came in to us in February, and we are now moving forward with these recommendations. So here's what we're doing. $2.2 billion over three years to provide free childcare for preschool age children that will save families an estimated $17,000 per child speaker $17,000 per child the reason we are focusing on this age group is because this is where the greatest need is this particular thank you. age group uses thank you supplementary thank you speaker Back to the Premier, or acting Premier as the case may be. Ontarians are desperate for relief when it comes to childcare. Lowering costs for anyone would be a welcome change, but this plan is not going to help women who want to return to work after parental leave. Families need a program that helps more than just those with children from two and a half to about four years old. Why did the Premier and her Liberal government leave families to fend for themselves for the past 15 years, and why are they leaving out many families now? Thank you. Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, a couple of things. So, that question asked a number of different things. First of all, the number one. The member from Hamilton Mountain is warned. Carry on. 
Number one and number two recommendation by our group that studied uh, closing the gender wage gap was to introduce childcare and childcare supports. And so by doing this, we are absolutely helping women out there be able to get, join the workforce faster. The second piece of his question had to do with uh, the infant group. So let me just tell you, right now in our province, there are about 14,000 young people in that infant toddler space. We wanted to make sure we were moving forward with supports where the great need was, which was that space from two and a half to four years old. And so that is what we're doing. But Answer. bottom line is our, our supports are continuing. So $90 million to support continued expansion, $53 million to create 40. Your question, the member from Beaches, East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Energy. In the 2013 Long-Term Energy Plan, our government made it, prior, made it a priority to ensure that 16 remote First Nation communities in northwestern Ontario will get connected to the electricity grid. The project is known as the Watai Power Project. And in the Minister's 2006 mandate letter, the Premier prioritized the need to continue negotiations with the federal government to secure an arrangement in sport support of this project, and we affirm the project's importance in the 2017 Long-Term Energy Plan. Speaker, I know that this has also been a top priority for the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation and every member of our government's caucus, including members from Thunder Bay and the former Energy Minister, minister from Ottawa, West Nepean. Question. So, Speaker, will the Minister please describe the progress that has been made on this file connecting NAN communities to the grid? Thank you, Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do want to thank the member for that question and, of course, his uh, constant advocacy for his constituents and on in this sector as well. And I know last week, Mr. Speaker, I was in Thunder Bay along with the Premier and the uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs and, of course, in spirit and in heart with the Minister of Northern Development and Mines um, to announce that Ontario and the federal government will be partnering with Wate Power in Fortis, Ontario yeah. to connect 16 remote First Nations communities to our province's clean, reliable and affordable electricity grid, Mr. Speaker. And, and many of these communities uh, have had to depend upon costly and dirty diesel generation power, Mr. Speaker. And by moving forward, this completed project will connect over 14,000 people wow. to our clean Answer. electricity grid for the first time, Mr. Speaker. And in this process, we've greatly improved the quality of life for these 16 communities. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for the great work he has done facilitating this agreement and his ongoing work to keep our power clean, green, affordable and reliable. I'm glad our government is taking action in partnership with Indigenous communities on this very important issue. And I understand that when complete in 2023, the Watai Power Grid Connection Project will be the largest Indigenous-led and Indigenous-owned infrastructure project in Ontario's history. This is truly a remarkable accomplishment. And as the Premier has said at the announcement, reconciliation, fairness and equity are no longer just words. In our government, they are actions, and we are walking this journey together. Ontario's economy is strong and growing, and we want to make sure all Ontarians including First Nations, feel the benefits of that growth. Question. So, Speaker, will the minister tell us more about how our government is working to ensure First Nations have access to this clean, affordable and, re and reliable power and fully participate in economic Mr. development in their communities? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Speaker, the Wate partnership uh, is a sign of partnership with First Nations. It's not just a question of jumping on a Tory bulldozer. Speaker, this government, this government is not a bully. We work with 120 First Nations to support their purchase of over $250 million in shares in Hydro One, giving them the opportunity for economic development. This is a plan that the NDP wants to <coughs> undo by buying back those shares. Speaker, our Fair Hydro Plan and its First Nation delivery credit, which interestingly both parties voted against, cuts most on-reserve customers' bills by over 50 per cent. Our $650 million Aboriginal yes, Loan Guarantee Program is an initiative under the Green Energy Act that the Conservatives want to repeal. Thank you. New question, the member from Simcoe Gray. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Education. 
First, I want to thank the minister for the recent announcement that the government is promising funds to purchase a site for a high school in the town of Saga Beach. I don't, I don't do that often. So. Mr. Speaker, officials with the town of Wasaga Beach and I believe the community has the population numbers to justify a secondary school. The town expects significant growth in the next few years. In addition, the town is currently planning a major downtown development project. All signs point towards the community needing a high school in the near future. So I ask, Mr. Speaker, will the government fund a high school in Wasaga Beach if asked to do so by the local school board? Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for this very important question. Mr. Speaker, we recognize that the Wasega Beach community is growing, and so are the adjacent communities. And so the community in Wasega Beach would be a good fit for a secondary school in the near future. Now, I understand that the Simcoe County District School Board will need to plan for additional secondary capacity in the foreseeable future, and uh, I want the member opposite to know that I have been in contact with the town and the board on this very important matter. It is important to note, however, that decisions regarding pupil accommodations are the responsibility of locally elected school boards. And it is also my understanding that the school board currently has a property designated for a secondary school in the development lands of the town of Wasega Beach. But Answer. this plan has not yet been registered with the town. And so my ministry is prepared to provide Simcoe County District School Board with provincial funding thank to you. assist with this acquisition. Back to the minister. I thank the minister very much for that answer. Uh, Wasaga Beach, as you know, has waited a long time for a high school. A new elementary school for the community is being planned right now, and I thank you for that. That will give us four elementary schools but no high school. So, Mr. Speaker, the mayor, council, and residents of Wasaga Beach want to know if there's anything else the minister can do to help make this project a reality. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, again, we know that this community is growing, and that's why we have expanded the number of projects a board can submit from 8 to 10 to better meet the needs of local communities. And we recently announced more than $10 million in funding for an elementary school and childcare spaces in Wasega Beach, which was so needed, and I'm happy to say that we were able to do that. We are open to accepting a proposal by the board for funding of a high school site. My minister is a ministry is prepared to provide the Simcoe County Board with provincial funding to assist with the acquisition of this designated secondary school site as soon as it is ready. It is my request that the town and the board take all the necessary planning steps to secure the site as soon as possible. And it is my hope that the board and the town Answer. will work together and have a collaborative discussion in planning for a new secondary school in Wasega Beach community and in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your question, a member from London, Fanshawe. My question is to the Acting Premier. Recently, I met with 36 Unifor members of Local 302 to hear their stories about the mounting pressures they are facing working as PSWs in long-term care. They spoke passionately about the myriad of challenges they face, including verbal abuse and routine physical abuse. One PSW described giving a bath to a resident with dementia. He headbutted her, leaving her with facial bruises and a split lip. Staff are advised that violence comes with a job. Workers are doing their very best, but when they only have 17 minutes per shift for each resident, they just can't do it. The Liberals have called their throne speech a plan for care and opportunity. Will the Acting Premier commit to also planning time to provide that care and implement a minimum standard of four hours per day for each long-term care residence and pass the Time to Care Act. Thank you. Acting Premier. Uh, Speaker, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I certainly share uh, the concern for our PSWs working not only in long-term care but in community care as well. Uh, they really are essential to uh, what our government is certainly doing, which is providing appropriate care in the appropriate setting with the appropriate type of uh, supports that they need. And certainly our government has shown, I think, our commitment uh, to personal support workers uh, across the province. We have made major investments. Uh, just uh, most recently, as the 2017 budget, a continued investment of $250 million 
uh, in the 2017-18 budget for community and personal support services. This also included a $10 million Answer. investment to eligible organizations for education and training in this particular uh, uh, part of the health care system through its PSW Thank training you. fund. Thank you, Mr. Supplementary. Speaker, we have a shortage of PSWs in this province, yet Nancy McMurphy, Unifor Local 302 president, told me that the programs to train new PSWs are being cancelled for lack of registration. Existing staff quit or take mental leave because they are exhausted and demoralized by their working conditions. PSWs want to do their best. They want to have enough time to get everyone ready for breakfast in the mornings, but they can't do it in just six minutes per resident. The Premier said that she is proposing that we make big changes in the way we support care for each other. Nice words. Does the Premier actually believe that a PSW can get someone ready for breakfast in just six minutes? And if she does, will the Premier take the six-minute challenge and post her photo after six minutes in the morning to Facebook? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We recently announced that we will be providing 15 million more hours of nursing, personal support and therapeutic care annually for residents, particularly in long-term care homes. And so we will be increasing the hours of care to an average of four hours per day per resident. Uh, clearly, the member opposite will be uh, uh, most interested in our budget this afternoon. Uh, we remain committed to this type of uh, support for seniors, for those who need that kind of personal support. Uh, we are doing everything we can to ensure the retention of PSWs. Uh, we want to make sure that they have uh, job satisfaction, that they are able to provide the care that is so valuable to the patients in their care, and we will be uh, addressing the situation uh, very, very soon. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. New question, the member from Davenport. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the minister responsible for early years and child care. Minister, I know that our government is committed to making sure families have access to high-quality, inclusive and affordable child care and early years programs. After inheriting a system in dire need for funding, our government made a clear priority to transform the way child care works. More and more young families are moving to my riding of families, so it's not um, strange that I actually hear so much from these families that they face challenges challenges when it comes to the affordability of child care, and I want to know what our government is doing to address this. Minister, please tell us what yesterday's announcement meant for families struggling to access affordable, licensed child care. Thank you. Minister responsible for early years of child thank care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Davenport for this very important question. Mr. Speaker, we know that many families face challenges when it comes to finding affordable, accessible, licensed child care in our province. That's why our government made a commitment to transform the way we deliver childcare in Ontario. And yesterday's historic announcement laid out our plan to do just that. Our commitment, Mr. Speaker, is to deliver high-quality licensed childcare free for preschool-aged children between the ages of two and a half and four, starting in the year 2020. So just think about that. This important step will make life easier, easier for tens of thousands of Ontario families. And our investment of $2.2 billion over three years will expand access to affordable childcare all across the province and save Answer. families $17,000 per child. Mr. Speaker, our plan will allow parents to go back to work when they choose and give our kids Thank the you. best possible start in life. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. And yesterday's announcement is indeed a historic step in transforming the way childcare works in Ontario. And I am proud to be part of a government that cares and is committed to providing support for families that need it. As we increase access and affordability, it is also important that we support the early years workforce. Can the minister please expand on what yesterday's announcement means for educators in the childcare sector? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to answer the member's question. Speaker, in Ontario, we have thousands of remarkable, world-class early years and childcare professionals who are educating and caring for our youngest learners. But we have heard that many of them face challenges in their profession because of low wages. Speaker, that's why yesterday I had the pleasure to announce that we will introduce a wage grid for program staff working in the early years and childcare sector by 2020. This wage
wage group grid will ensure that close to 20,000 child care workers entering the field will receive a salary in alignment with ECEs working in kindergarten beginning in 2020. This important investment is about fairness and respect. It will support our early years professionals and help attract tens of thousands of talented professionals. Speaker, we are creating jobs and we are going to add 20,000 more early childhood educators. I'd like to provide a reminder to all people that warnings stay the entire day. New question, the member from Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. The failed mother risk care testing method resulted in Ontario children being ripped apart from their families under scientifically unsubstantiated allegations of parental drug abuse. This government finally commissioned a report which outlined gross procedural overreach, including testing body samples without written consent. Mr. Speaker, charter rights were violated. Parents will be seeking justice against this government in our courts. Will the minister tell us if he plans to admit wrongdoing and pay compensation or fight these families in court? Thank you. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to start by uh, thanking the Commissioner uh, for her work and uh, all of those that were involved in, uh, in bringing forward uh, these important recommendations. And the recommendations that were brought forward uh, through the Commission uh, were accepted uh, by our government, and uh, they will help us to continue uh, to build a child uh, welfare system here in Ontario uh, that puts families and, uh, and children at the centre of uh, decision-making. Um, we want to make sure that when, uh, when a family and a young person uh, engage in the child protection system, uh, that, um, you know, that they're placed into a situation where uh, they could navigate uh, through that system and, uh, and a young person uh, always feels as though that uh, their uh, rights are being protected. I know that the Attorney uh, General has— The member from Dufferin Caledon is warned. Your wrap-up is over. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again to the Minister. The Mother Risk Commission has shattered confidence in our health care system, our justice system, and the children and youth services in one fell swoop. Experts believe that, if anything, the report underestimates the scope of those affected. Mr. Speaker, we have heard nothing specific about what the government plans to do for improving forensic methodology in the future, and the report was released a month ago. Will the minister share with us what measures are being taken to ensure that all of the investigative forensic techniques are scientifically valid? Thank you. Minister Attorney General. Attorney General. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Uh, first and foremost, uh, let me say this, that what happened to the children and families that were impacted uh, by the flawed mother risk uh, hair testing uh, is absolutely heartbreaking. Um, as the, the Minister for Children and Youth Services said, that we, we thank the Commissioner Beeman uh, and her commission and those who have worked uh, with her uh, for this important report and thoughtful recommendations. Uh, Speaker, uh, we have already indicated that we accept all the recommendations. These rec recommendations offer a path forward. Um, they will guide us as we continue to strengthen, modernize, and transform our child care welfare system to place children, youth, and families at the center of everything we do. Speaker, as immediate first steps, our government will follow on Commissioner Beeman's advice to continue the confidential counseling services yes, that were offered to families through the commission. And we will establish a task force of outside experts as well as families, indigenous peoples, and the black community to guide our Thank next you. steps as we work towards address the recommendations. New question, the member from Essex. Speaker, my question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, for over 100 years, rural families and farms from Chatham-Kent have had access to clean, clear, and safe well water from ancient aquifers deep underground. That is, until water on family farms that surround Samsung's North Kent one wind turbine site became black and undrinkable when Samsung began pile driving into the aquifer to support the construction of turbines. This Liberal government says that the water is safe to drink. And When I last posed this question to the government, I was ejected from this chamber for offering the minister a drink of water to take a sample. But, Speaker, I don't blame the minister for not wanting to jeopardize his own health. No reasonable person would. But why does this government refuse to initiate a health hazard investigation for the residents and rural families to protect them from exposure to a known toxicant? Thank you. 
Speaker, Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and, and thank you to the member opposite for uh, a very important question because it is important, Speaker, that. Uh, that government protect the quality of drinking water, just as it does the quality of air and uh, the quality of our land. You know, groundwater quality, it, it's, it's taken very seriously, and, and uh, we are actively, actively, Speaker, holding the company accountable for, for addressing the complaints related to changes in well water quality. The ministry, uh, Speaker, has undertaken a review of water quality data to ensure that residents uh, to ensure residents that their water is safe to drink thus far speaker the analysis has not shown a connection between water quality and construction activity the company has informed the ministry that it's working with homeowners where they are supplying alternative water supplies to provide and pay for a licensed well contractor to inspect their wells and answer any questions they may have, Speaker. Uh, we've yes, also sir. had a very productive meeting with representatives from Water Wells First two weeks ago, about two weeks ago, and the ministry, ministry staff shared the Thank results you. of our findings. Supplementary. Speaker, I provided the Premier and the Minister a copy of a report commissioned by EBS Structural, who were contracted to construct supports for Hydro One transmission towers that carry the hydro from the North Kent wind turbines in question. In a shocking discovery, EBS Structural ruled out the use of traditional deep foundations such as caissons and driven pile as not feasible due to the following quote, the potential for driven pile to cause issues with nearby active water wells. That's a smoking gun, Speaker. Even Hydro One, Hydro One knew that pile driving would contaminate nearby wells. It's unacceptable that this Liberal government is taking the word of Samsung over Ontario families. Is the Premier inviting a lawsuit from the Chatham Kent families for the cleanup costs of removing black shale from their households? And is your government fully prepared to pick up the cost indefinitely with the associated health costs? And will you follow? When you tell all Ontarians that black shale is now safe to drink for all Ontarians. Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. Well, thank you, Speaker. You know, I want to go back and reiterate what I said earlier that uh, we've had a productive meeting with representatives from Water Wells First about two weeks ago. Uh, at that meeting, we shared our results uh, about our extensive testing speaker. Um, we're waiting to hear still from Water Wells First for the data that, that they say they have. I would be really appreciative of uh, if, if we could get our hands on it so we could look at their data. But the data that has been collected on our behalf, uh, Speaker, uh, we have shared with Water Wells First. You know, again, after thorough testing, Speaker, the ministry has found no evidence of any ongoing or permanent impact to water quality related to wind turbine construction in the area. And I want to close, Speaker, by re reiterating what I said at the very beginning. You know, A, we yes, take sir. these concerns very carefully, and we're holding the company accountable to address these complaints. Thank you. New question. The member from Kingston in the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. I am incredibly proud to represent a community that includes two islands, Wolf and Howe Island. Both islands are home to a wonderful arts and culture scene, great local businesses and, of course, breathtaking views. It is no wonder that so many Kingstonians, tourists and visitors and those from further afield flock to the region. Amherst Island, which is located just outside of my community of Kingston and the Islands, is also remarkable and draws tourists to places like Topsy Farms. But, Speaker, these communities have unique needs. They need different transportation options from communities on the mainland. Speaker, they need reliable ferry services so that those who live on the islands can make it to work on time and that tourists are able to make an impromptu trip Question. for a concert or dinner. Speaker, through you to the minister, would the minister please provide the members of this House with more information on what our government is doing to improve ferry service for island residents Thank and you. tourists alike? Minister Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Kingston and the Islands for that question and for her phenomenal advocacy on behalf of our community. 
and she is absolutely correct. Communities like those on Wolf and Amherst Islands do have unique needs, and we as a government do have a responsibility to respond. We heard loud and clear that there was a need for more reliable ferry service, and that's why we are moving forward with an over $61 million investment for two new ferries to serve the Wolf and Amherst Islands. The two new larger ferries will better serve the people and the businesses that depend on ferry service as part of their daily commute or to get goods and services and to market. Specifically, the new Wolf Island Ferry will be able to carry up to almost 400 passengers and 75 vehicles, and the Amherst Island Ferry will carry up to Answer. 300 passengers and 40 vehicles. And so we know that improving ferry service to the Wolf and Amherst Islands will better connect these two communities. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. This is truly a historic investment for my community, and it builds on investments like our government's $60 million for the commitment to the third crossing, over $1.3 million for community cycling infrastructure, and more funding for transit. Speaker, the benefits of these two new ferries are endless. Larger vessels will allow us to move more people, and that Wolf Island, a new ferry, will ensure that two vessels are running during the peak travel periods. And the Frontenac II that currently services Amherst Island will become a backup vessel for the Eastern Region Ferry Fleet, which will improve reliability and safety for all ferry services. Speaker, our government, unlike the party opposite, understands the impact of climate change, and we know that we cannot continue on the same path of polluting and leaving the problem to the next generation. We owe it The member from Prince Edward Hastings, I remembered, is warned. Finish your question, please. You're on wrap up. Speaker, through you to the minister, would the minister please provide an update on how we are making sure that our new ferries help yes, support a sustainable environment? Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the yes, member for the supplementary. And as she said, our government takes the issue of climate change very seriously. The transportation sector contributes almost one third of the greenhouse gas emissions that we produce, so there's a clear need for action. And that is why I am so pleased to say our two new ferries will be fully electric, non cable vessels, the first of their kind in Canada. Electrified ferries will help reduce greenhouse gas emissions by taking the equivalent of 1,357 cars off the road compared to conventional diesel ferries. And while the Ontario Conservatives refuse to act, our government has a plan to reduce gridlock while also supporting our environment. So whether you live on Wolf or Amherst Island, depend on ferry as part of your daily commute, or you're looking Answer. to explore all the islands have to offer, our government's absolutely committed to providing convenient and green options to get you where you need to go faster than you do Thank now. You. Thank you. New question, the member from Dufferin Caledon. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. More than two years after the government adopted portions of my private member's bill to support recycled aggregate, some municipalities and government organizations still do not use the safe and reliable alternative to new aggregate from quarries. According to Aggregate Recycling Ontario, Infrastructure Ontario and Metrolinx are failing to use much recycled aggregate in their infrastructure projects. As the Independent Environmental Commissioner of Ontario said, quote, Metrolinx should be a leader, not a laggard, in green procurement, especially for a high-impact material such as aggregate. Will the minister direct Metrolinx and Infrastructure Ontario to use as much recycled aggregate as possible? Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure. I thank the uh, member for the question. Uh, as you know, Infrastructure Ontario uh, does a tremendous amount of uh, construction work and procurement. Uh, they use the highest standards uh, in moving forward, um, and certainly I will bring this particular issue to their attention. Uh, I realize that the member is concerned about it, uh, and I will get back to her with a technical uh, briefing and perhaps arrange a meeting uh, with Infrastructure Ontario uh, and to, uh, to look at this particular issue. Thank you. Supplementary. There are no scientific arguments that would suggest recycled aggregate is worse than primary aggregate. 
The previous Minister of Economic Development was only able to identify education and outreach as actions the government was taking to promote aggregate recycling. Yet, according to Aggregate Recycling Ontario, quote, beyond the Ministry of Transportation, no leadership in sustainable construction practices seems to be provided. The Environmental Commissioner said that despite parking lots being a prime candidate for recycled aggregate and that Metrolinx is one of the largest parking operators in North America, Metrolinx does not appear to use recycled aggregate in building or maintaining those parking lots. The government is the largest consumer of aggregate in Ontario, so it has a responsibility to use this resource sustainably. It's an easy win, Minister. Question. Will the Minister ensure that when public funds are used for infrastructure projects, recycled aggregates are considered and used as Thank you. Minister. Minister. The Minister of Transportation, Speaker. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Speaker, and uh, thank you for the question. Certainly, uh, as the Aggregate Resources Act was uh, going through this uh, legislature under Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, there was a lot of discussion about recycled aggregates, and I know that um, there are several pits that are continuing to increase the, not only the recycled aggregate uh, supply in their pits, but also there is increasing use for recycled aggregate. A recycled aggregate um, is not appropriate for all uh, projects. There is a plan to increase it as we can. But in terms of looking at the huge projects that Metrolinx and our government is putting forward in infrastructure, we continue to make sure that the high-quality products that are required for each and every and separate project are there. Many of the projects Answer. have a plan to um, and a formula that they need to use. Sometimes recycled aggregate is not appropriate for those plans. We continue to build high-quality projects. The question. The member from Algoma, Manitoba. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Your ministry is dismantling the radio tower near the township of White River and building a new one. However, the ministry has refused to let the township fire department radio be transferred to the new tower. We are two weeks away from the dismantling of that tower. Is this government ready to help the Township of Wright River to protect an essential service for the region? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. President, thank you for the question. I think Mr. Speaker. the ministry does operate some radio towers to support the forest fire operations, and we're getting ready for the, the 2018 uh, 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 session or you know trying to prepare ourselves and I think part of the issue here was that there was a safety hazards with this tower and that's the reason why it needed to be uh, dismantled so in a sense I think our first duty is obviously to ensure that we uh, protect the safety of people there was some concern that it was overloaded and that ice could could make it fall so the the operations are dedicated to ensuring the safety of all citizens and that's the reason for the the, the uh, the choices made by the ministry. Answer, thank you. Supplementary. Again to the minister. The township of White River is located along the highway on Trans Canada Highway. Their fire department radio helps provide a system to call out their department for fires as well as automobile extrications services to the Ministry of Transportation through this section of Northern Ontario. By not transferring the fire department radio to the new tower, this government is putting at risk the lives of Ontarians passing through this section of the Trans-Canada Highway. How is this government going to protect Ontarians if they don't transfer the fire department radio? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Mr. President, I'm happy to talk to the member about the details of the, the proposal and his concerns. Our information, the information that I have in front of me, is that indeed the services are transferred to a, another radio tower to provide the similar services. So we can uh, have a conversation maybe after to see exactly whether the information is correct. But what I have in front of me is indeed the primary concern was the safety, and it continues to be uh, responsive to all the needs of the community. Thank you. New question. The member from Barry. Hey. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Speaker, our government is committed to improving air quality in Ontario. 
That's why last week Ontario introduced new, stricter standards for sulfur dioxide emissions. The new standard is five times stronger than the previous standard, leading to increased protection of the environment and the health of Ontarians. Speaker, can the minister please explain to the House how the new standard for sulfur dioxide builds upon previous efforts to improve air quality in Ontario? Thank you, minister of the Environment, Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member from Barrie for that very important question. Speaker, as the member mentioned, uh, we're committed to taking action to improve air quality in Ontario. Uh, that's why we're updating sulfur dioxide uh, emission standards to, to, to further ensure, Speaker, that every person in Ontario has clean air to breathe. And with these new standards, Speaker, we're working to reduce pollution from industry, uh, leading to further protection of human health and the environment for Ontario. Speaker, the update builds on previous, previous, uh, previous efforts to reduce air pollution and improve air quality in Ontario. Things like putting an end to uh, dirty coal-fired power generation, uh, setting 68 new health-based emission standards. Uh, speaker, we are continuing to take action to ensure that everyone in Ontario is breathing very yes, clean air, uh, air. Just as I said in the last uh, question, Speaker, this is a key role thank of you. government. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. I know this is a very important issue to all the people in in Ontario, but particularly to my riding of Barrie. Speaker, shutting down dirty coal-fired generation is considered one of the single largest green initiatives in all of North America. Here, here. Yeah. Since 2005, we've seen that smog levels have significantly decreased in Ontario. In 2005, there were 53 smog days. In 2017, there were zero. That's a significant decrease. Speaker, our actions to improve air quality have made a real tangible difference in people's lives and have saved billions of dollars for the health care system. Ontarians are now able to breathe easier, thanks in part to the work we've done. Question. Speaker, can the minister please explain why Ontario is considered a leader in the global effort to reduce pollution? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Barrie for, uh, for that important question. You know, while shutting down dirty uh, coal-burning electrical generating plants was an important initiative, we knew it wasn't enough, Speaker. We knew uh, we had to do more, and that's why we implemented our cap on carbon dioxide pollution, which caps how much businesses are allowed to pollute. You know, Speaker, we're reinvesting every dollar from that program, that cap and invest program, uh, every dollar from those proceeds into green initiatives that are further driving down the carbon dioxide pollution that is being admitted. You know, Speaker, I want to say you compare what this side, this government, is doing with what the Conservatives uh, are proposing over there. They aren't walking away from, from climate change, Speaker. They're driving their bus away from climate change, Speaker. Uh, they don't even believe in climate change anymore. In fact, Speaker, I will say, Answer. I will say that uh, now is not the time to slash investments just when families need it the most. Now is the time to Thank invest, you. Speaker. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.